All right. Well, we've got uh, folks joining us and we'll just give it a another minute or so to let people join, but I'll maybe get started um, with, with some introductions and queuing up our presentation today. So I'll just start by saying good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in Canada. And uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Megan Gervais and I'm the Chief Technology Officer here at Protein Industries Canada. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today, wherever you find yourself across our country. Um, as attendees, you'll, you'll be muted and we'll ask that you use the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions that you have throughout the presentation. So um, if questions come up along the way, feel free to pop them into the discussion as we go. And we'll hold questions to the end and then uh, Chris should have about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation to, to address any questions that come in. Um, I'll start our presentation off today just by noting that Protein Industries Canada acknowledges that our head office, located in Regina, Saskatchewan, is on Treaty 4 territory, the original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Salto, Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Further, we respect and affirm the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across this land. Protein Industries Canada has and will continue to honour the commitments to self-determination and sovereignty that we have made to Indigenous nations and people. I am pleased now to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Chris Marangeli. Chris has a PhD in food and nutrition science and is a res registered dietitian. He is a scientist and food industry professional with over 12 years of experience across consumer packaged goods and the Canadian agricultural sector with expertise in human and nutrition sciences, regulatory affairs, and consumer insights and equity. Currently, Chris is leading our regulatory center of excellence at Protein Industries Canada. Prior to joining PIC, Chris has included uh, senior nutritional and regulatory positions at Pulse Canada and Kellogg Canada. He has served on numerous advisory committees, including a board member for the Canadian Federation of Dietetic Research, and is a member of the Canadian Advisory Committee for ILSI North America. Um, Chris currently serves on the Scientific Advisory Committee for CFDR and is a jury member for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's waste reduction, Food Waste Reduction Challenge for Novel Technologies. So with that introduction, I'm going to hand the presentation and our discussion today over to Chris. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Megan, for the, the kind introduction. I'd like to thank all of the delegates uh, for attending today's webinar in front of PAC labeling a regulatory journey. Taking a touch on numerous aspects of Canada's new, Canada's new front of PAC labeling uh, regulatory framework, but I'm going to give a little bit more information and context as it pertains to Canada's food system. So just an overview of what I am going to talk about today. I'm going to go through front of PAC labeling and defining what in fact it is and what Canada's approach to front of pack labeling is. It differs a little bit from other jurisdictions around the world. I'm going to talk about the nutrient, nutrients of concern that encompass the front of pack labeling regulatory framework around sodium saturated fat and sugar um, as it links to cardiometabolic health outcomes. And then talk about these nutrients of concern with a Canadian context. So where is where are Canadians, uh, what are Canadians intakes of these nutrients of concern currently and today? and what was used as the basis for establishing the, diet, the daily values for sodium saturated fat and sugar. I'm gonna talk about front of pack labeling implementation in Canada and the regulatory journey that ensued when the, um, over, the over the past eight to 10 years and, and how we got to where we are today. I think the regulation for new stakeholders to the sector, it might've snuck, snuck up on them um, in July, 2022 when the regulation was announced, but I just want to give that historical purview so there's an understanding that um, there was a lot of consultation and, and, and background work that went into this um, um, regulation before it came into place. I'm going to talk about the criteria, some of the pertinent criteria around the front of pack labeling in Canada, and then try and um, for those individuals or stakeholders who might be concerned about front of pack labeling, I would flip this, this concern on its head and try and view it as an opportunity as we look at focusing on dietary patterns and not specific nutrients of concern in food products. So with that, with that let's get started on talking about front of pack labeling, just giving an overview of what Canada's approach is to front of pack labeling currently in the country. So basically front of pack labeling is the use of symbols and principal display panels of foods with the purpose of rapidly identifying some characteristics of uh, characteristic of a food. In this case, it's the nutritive characteristics of a food. So they can they can manifest themselves in one of three ways. So you can identify the presence of positive nutrients to encourage consumption. Uh, 
You can identify the presence of negative nutrients to discourage consumption, or it can be a combination of both. And we see um, all three of these types of, of, of labeling in play um, around the world in one form or the other. Generally, there are various categories of front of pack labeling. One category is the endorsement logo. So these are examples of endorsement logos that are used around the world where there is an algorithm or a calculation that happens behind the scenes. And if you hit certain criteria, you get the green light to use a specific logo. These criteria can encompass positive nutrients like dietary fiber and uh, negative nutrients like total fat, uh, which I wouldn't say is a, is a negative nutrient per se in most jurisdictions now, but things like saturated fat and sugar and, 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 and uh, sodium certainly are. We've had endorsement logos in Canada in the past. Some of you might be familiar with the Heart and Stroke Foundation's Health Check logo that was um, in the Canadian marketplace from 1999 and sunsetted in 2014. There are graded approaches uh, to front of pack labeling. One, one example is the Nutri-Score system on the left-hand side of the screen, which is a voluntary system that has been endorsed by the WHO and been implemented as a voluntary system in various countries in Europe. And there has been talk of implementing front of pack labeling as part of um, Europe's farm to fork strategy uh, moving forward, but that is yet to come to fruition. Another example is the Health Star rating currently being used in um, Australia and New Zealand. Other examples are nutrient specific interpretive systems like the facts up front or the traffic light system currently being used in the in the UK, which highlights levels of uh, fat, saturated fats, sugars and salt in foods. And then there are warning systems, which are currently being used again around the world, for example, in Israel and South America. And this latter example is the approach that Canada is taking with its front of pack labeling initiative. So these are the, the front of pack uh, or nutrition, nutrient symbols that will be required as front of pack labels in Canada if thresholds for sugar, saturated fat, and sodium um, are above a certain threshold. Implementation of the regulation is January 1, 2026, where compliance is supposed to be um, in place. Any decision before that time uh, to implement front of pack labeling on a principal display panel in Canada would be a business decision by the stakeholder. So these are examples from the government of Canada, um, I guess some mock-ups on some food examples on how front of pack labels or these labels will look on pack. And it's important to note that the threshold for most foods will be about 15% the daily value for sodium saturated fat and sugar. And this 15% threshold aligns with Canada's regulations around nutrient content claims currently. So the minimum threshold for nutrient content claim for, for most micronutrients, for example, uh, for, for a source of claim would be 5% as a threshold. And to make a high source or excellent source claim, it's 15%. So that 15% threshold is chosen for most foods. There are some caveats to that, which I'll discuss later on to the presentation, but that's generally where the criteria sits for most foods at that 15% DV level. What is a daily value? Well, a daily value are reference amounts expressed in milligrams, uh, grams, or micrograms of nutrients to consume or not to exceed each day. The daily value for carbohydrates, total fat, saturated fat, and trans fat are based on a 2,000 kilocalorie diet, typically as a proportion of energy intake. Uh, micronutrient daily values are absolute amounts. So a good example is sodium, for example. Um, it's 2,300 milligrams per day across the population. And therefore, when you're looking at the nutrient facts table as the percent daily value, it's the proportion of the daily value. And, and triggering front of pack labeling would be 15% or more of pack. How do we come up with a daily value? Well, there's, there's various analyses that go in, come into play, and it depends on which um, how much data is available, uh, determines which um, outcome is used to establish daily values. The recommended daily allowance is the nutrient requirements of 98% of the population. Uh, the upper limit is the highest amount that does not pose um, a toxic risk to an individual. There's adequate amounts where when there's no RDA, uh, but there's an observed level in a healthy population, a good example is fiber. The fiber DV is based on the adequate intake. And then there's chronic disease reduction and current intakes. And this is generally what has been used to establish the DV for the nutrients of concern in Canada, sodium, saturated fat, and sugar.
The DVEs across these three nutrients for sodium are 2,300 milligrams per day. For saturated fat, it's 20 grams per day, which is based on 10% energy on a 2,000 kilocalorie diet. And then sugar, total sugars, is 100 grams per day. So with that, I'm going to take a minute and talk about links with respect to these nutrients of concern and cardiometabolic health outcomes. And what does the data look like with respect to sodium saturated fat and health outcomes that are of concern to the population in Canada? And it's important to note that when you read some of the references around established DVs or nutrients of concern, very often um, global organizations such as the World Health Organization are referenced as, as being um, regulation or policy being in alignment with, with organizations like the WHO. And I will say that, that, that on a global scale, sodium, sugars, and saturated fat have been top of mind for jurisdictions around the world. And over the last few years, there have been numerous reports and guidelines published by the World Health Organization. Uh, in many regards, they are controversial and they've caused quite a bit of chatter, but they, they do stand the test of time with respect to governments and jurisdictions looking um, in some cases uh, for alignment with the WHO um, as a united front, I would say. So we're gonna talk first about sodium and sodium from a physiological perspective has been linked to elevated blood pressure levels and, and can ultimately lead to increased risk of hypertension. Hypertension is often described as the silent killer because many individuals don't know that they have hypertension, but it is a risk factor for cardiometabolic diseases such as ischemic heart disease or stroke and cardiovascular disease. So looking at data on the left-hand side of the screen, the top two graphs are looking at ischemic heart disease mortality rates. The bottom two graphs are looking at stroke mortality rates. The graphs on the left-hand side of the screen are looking at systolic blood pressure. The graphs on the right are looking at diastolic blood pressure and each line represents an age group. And just to note that as blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic blood pressure increases, the risk for um, the, the, the mortality rates for ischemic heart disease and stroke increase in a linear fashion, just to demonstrate the cardiometabolic risk and the association with disease. I'm showing this study as, as a landmark study, and I'm not going to talk about the, the bottom lines here, the DASH diet, which is the dietary approach to stopping hypertension diet. I want to focus on the control diet. This is an interesting study with 412 uh, participants, where at the beginning of the study, they were randomized to either the control diet, which would be a typical Western diet, or a DASH diet. And within that randomization as a part of the control diet, for example, over the course of, for 30-day blocks, each individual received high intermediate or low sodium diet. So it was a crossover design. So within the control diet, there'd be a 30 day period where they receive either high levels of sodium, intermediate levels or low levels of sodium. And all I wanna show here is that independent of anything else and just sodium reduction, uh, independent of, so, of, of anything else and just looking at sodium reduction, there was a, a close to linear reduction of both systolic and diastolic blood pressure with, with sodium reduction. And shown um, in another study, looking at 103 trials that included 107 comparison interventions and an end of six, over, just over uh, uh, 6,900 individuals, looking at uh, reductions in sodium intake and the linear reduction in systolic blood pressure, demonstrating that linkage. So obviously the play here is that reducing sodium levels in, in diets can reduce risk of, of hypertension and possibly um, other cardiometabolic risk factors. Moving on to saturated fat, um, again, another very contentious uh, topic in the nutrition world. Uh, we're all familiar with uh, linking saturated fat with risk and health, possibly just from layman's language that we use um, we, um, on a day-to-day -day basis and we hear in the media. But over the last few years, saturated fat has come under scrutiny and the call for reduced saturated fat has come under scrutiny because of trials that have demonstrated um, no effects on uh, cardiovascular disease risk. And this is actually demonstrated in a, in a uh, editorial published in APNM, uh, spearheaded by Benoit Lamarche and Patrick Couture, where they indicate that dietary saturated fats primarily arise from low-density lipoprotein cholesterol while having a relatively neutral impact on other key cardiovascular disease risk factors. Recent epidemiological data also challenged the concept of saturated fat increases on the risk of, of cardiovascular disease. Now, this has been acknowledged in the scientific literature. So a few years later, um, spearheaded by uh, Frank Sachs et al. as part of the American Heart Association Presidential Advisory, 
they did a fairly extensive systematic review of saturated fatty acids, acknowledging the fact that meta-analyses of observational studies of randomized clinical trials have come to discordant conclusions around the relationship of saturated fat and risk of cardiovascular disease. But one thing that is important when we look at saturated fat, it's essential to the interpretation of these results from these trials, is that the macronutrient composition of the diet and the comparator diet is used when evaluating these analyses. And I'll go through, through what I mean in the, in the subsequent slides. So this is an analysis, that, uh, systematic review and meta-regression analysis that looked at the effects of substituting 1% of daily calories from saturated fat and replacing that with 1% calories from polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, and carbohydrate. Now for that carbohydrate arm, it would probably be a mixture of quality carbohydrate and also refined grains. But many of the foods consumed by the population um, in this respect would be refined grains and simple carbohydrate, and those carbohydrates that are deemed to be of lower quality. Um, and these results demonstrate that when you replace saturated fat with poly and monounsaturated fat, the reduction in LDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol, which we know is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, is reduced to a higher extent compared to the carbohydrate replacement. On the triglyceride side of things, you get a reduction in triglycerides with replacing saturated fat with poly and monounsaturates, but that replacement with carbohydrate actually increased triglycerides. And HDL cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol, um, the reduction in HDL cholesterol from the replacement with poly and monounsaturated fats was less than carbohydrate. Looking at cardiovascular disease, for example, and replacing saturated fat, an isochloric substitution of saturated fat with equivalent energy from say trans fat, mono and polyunsaturated fats, refined carbohydrates and whole grains, you can see that the effects in cardiovascular disease are quite different. So when you replace with trans fat, trans fat has a, has a, facilitates a higher risk in cardiovascular disease. Mono and polyunsaturated fats facilitate a substantial reduction in risk of cardiovascular disease. Refined grades have a, a mood effect or a neutral effect and whole grain replacement, replacing saturates with whole grains reduces uh, cardiovascular disease risk by 9% from the data from the nurse's health study. This uh, lends to, um, I think, the overall principles around the implementation of frontal pack labeling in Canada, where the hope is, is that frontal pack labeling will help Canadians choose healthier options. And it's not really specifically looking at the nutrient in a reductionist form. The hope is that looking for foods that, while are lower in saturated fat, increase or facilitate and increase or choosing foods that are higher in mono and polyunsaturated fat for a better public health outcome. And finally, I'm going to touch on sugars, and I'm going to really dig in a little bit to the guideline for sugar intake for adults and children. I think sugar is something that we hear a lot about to reduce in dietary patterns. And uh, the WHO's report on uh, sugar intake for adults and children uh, garnered a lot of attention around the world from, from various communities in the academic government and uh, industry spaces. And it's important to note that the guideline around sugars from the WHO is really about free sugars and not specifically total sugars. And the recommendation is to limit the intake of free sugars to less than 10% of total energy intake. Many of you might not be familiar with what free sugars are. So these are mono and disaccharides. So it would include things like table sugar, regular sugar that you, you would call sugar in your colloquial language um, that are added to foods and beverages by the manufacturer, cook or consumer. They're also sugars that are naturally present in honey syrups, fruit juices and fruit concentrates. So any sugars that are generally not intrinsic or not encapsulated in the cell wall where you can taste the sweetness. And it's important to note that the WHO's recommendation around free sugars to consume uh, less, to consume free sugars at a level that is less than 10% total energy, this is not based on cardiometabolic risk factors. This is based on prevalence or incidence of dental caries in the population. That being said, when we read dietary policies about limiting sugars in the diet, we can't help it. But, but come across data and conversations around effects on cardiometabolic risk. And it's important to note that the story around sugar is not necessarily black and white. And a good example is the dose response analyses that I'm showing here on risk of overweight and obesity, where we see on the left-hand side of the screen, the relative risk of becoming overweight or obese with increased consumption of sugar-sweetened sugar beverages is generally a linear curve. And this is likely because foods like sugar sweetened beverages offer a lot of calories and generally very little nutritional benefit like fibers, 
of proteins or other, other micronutrients um, that have cardiometabolic protective effects from a cardiometabolic perspective. When we look at fruits, which we also hear that individuals want to limit because of um, they're high in sugar, when we look at something like fruit, it's almost a linear reduction in risk until it sort of starts to level off at the higher end of a fruit consumption. And this is likely because of excess calorie consumption from fruits and causing perhaps some dietary imbalances um, um, in, in the diet as fruits um, are indexed fairly highly in a specific dietary pattern. The same story can be said for type two diabetes, looking at sugar sweetened beverage versus, versus fruit consumption. So just a note here that I think the policy, when you read the policies around front of pack labeling and sugars and it, um, from the government of Canada, looking at uh, Canada's dietary guidelines, it's really to steer consumers away from those foods that demonstrate very little nutrient density, but are indexing highly on uh, sugars and provide little nutritional value outside that of um, energy. This is a great uh, meta-analysis and systematic review from the group at University of Toronto, spearheaded by John Stephen Piper, looking at fructose. It's uh, fructose is a component of table sugar. Table sugar is a disaccharide made up of glucose and fructose linked together. And uh, this analysis demonstrated that fructose does not seem to cause weight gain when it's substituted for other carbohydrates in diet providing similar calories. Free fructose at high doses that provide excess calories modestly increase body weight, an effect that may be due to the extra calories rather than fructose itself. And just to demonstrate this, this is again results from a review of uh, meta-analyses looking at A, the isochloric substitution of sugar with other carbohydrates, hypercaloric addition um, to the diet with sugar or hypochloric subtraction by subtracting sugar out of the diet. And as you can see here in the top two studies that look at isochloric substitution, the effects on body weight are quite neutral. When you're using sugar to increase calories in the diet, weight gain ensued, and looking at removing calories to the diet by removing sugar, there was some weight loss or even a neutral effect, demonstrating that it's likely the caloric story rather than the sugar story itself. That being said, foods that index higher on sugar with very little nutrient value are associated with body weight gains, such as sugar sweetened beverages. So with that, I'm going to transition to nutrients concern and give some context of where Canadians are today with respect to, to these nutrients of concern to understand where we are uh, with respect to consumption of sodium saturated fat and sugar as part of dietary patterns. So in 2017, the government of Canada published this report using data from the Canadian Community Health Survey. And it's worthwhile to note that a great swath of the Canadian population is consuming sodium levels that greatly exceed uh, the 2300 milligram uh, benchmark or um, daily value for sodium. So you can see particularly amongst teenage males, 92 and 96%. And we look at mean intakes for sodium, generally speaking, uh, for, for males um, and to some extent younger females, all exceeding on a mean, on a uh, look, just looking at the average mean intake levels that are exceeding 2300 milligrams of sodium per day. This is an analysis again of the, the latest iteration of the Canadian Community Health Survey from uh, the University of Val looking at saturated fat intake. Generally speaking, Canadians across age and sex groups are consuming saturated fat at about 10% their total energy intake, which aligns with the WHO and Health Canada's recommendation in the DV. When they did the analysis, they broke the analysis down to look at the components of foods contributing to saturated fat intake according to the three categories of food outlined in Canada's food guide, which are protein foods, whole grain foods, and vegetable foods and then looked at all other foods outside those categories. And it's worthwhile to note that the protein food group, which encompasses both milk and dairy alternatives, as well as meat and uh, meat alternatives, was the most prominent uh, food group contributing to saturated fat intakes in Canada. And the second highest obviously was those other, all other food groups, were, which were likely highly refined and processed foods outside the other two um, food groups endorsed by the government of Canada, whole grain foods and vegetables and fruits. And saturated, uh, sorry, and, and sugar, finally, when uh, the DV for sugar was proposed uh, back in 2014, I believe, at 100 grams per day, we didn't have a lot of data on free sugar consumption in Canada. So the 2004 Canadian Community Health Save was used to evaluate sugar intake in Canada, and the mean intake for sugar was about 110 grams per day. 
noting that amongst the teenage population, vast majority of teenage, um, the, the consumption of sugar was, was um, um, fairly uh, large or fairly um, high compared, compared to the mean amongst this population. So the proposed DV was uh, set for about 100 grams per day based on current consumption rates. That's the approach that other jurisdictions around the world have taken, such as Europe and Australia, which set the DV about 90 grams per day. And if we look at the 10% energy from free sugars in the Canadian diet, 10% um, would be about 50 grams. So you could probably in a roundabout way say half the sugar is coming from free sugars and the other half um, coming from other, other sources, such as sources of intrinsic sugars like fruits and vegetables. We can't ignore, if we start to limit sugar too much, we're gonna start minimizing consumption of healthy foods that do contain sugars. When they looked at where sugar was coming from, particularly in this, this uh, population of 19 year olds, which is the highest level of sugar intake, uh, soft drinks were the highest uh, contributor of sugar intake. Fruit was the third followed by confectionery. Soft drinks were also a contributor in the adult population to a great extent. More recent analysis using the 2015 Canadian Community Health Survey from the group at the University of Toronto demonstrated uh, that free sugar consumption, they were able to tease that out, was about at the 10% level, which aligns with the, the WHO's recommendation. And again, total sugar intake pretty much aligns or is below the recommendation from uh, Health Canada or the DV, the DV uh, for sugar across the, uh, across the adult population. Subsequent analysis by the Government of Canada compared the 2004 uh, results from the 2015 results on, on sugar intake. For the most part, it's largely unchanged with a slight reduction in the, uh, the, uh, the teenage population and the, uh, the adult population um, in 2015. And it was slightly um, higher in 2015 compared to 2004 levels in the two to eight year old, in the two to eight year old group. So with that, Knowing where we are, you know why why we have front to pack labeling in Canada come into place. What are the concerns around sodium, sugar, and saturated fat? I think it's important to bring some context as to how we got here and what is what is the work that went into front to pack labeling. A lot of new stakeholders coming to the the food sector in Canada might not understand the context for it and the the background work that went into play and the consultations that were in effect to inform. Um, the the uh, the front of pack labeling regulations that were put in place in July 2014. So this is a map. I'm not going to go through this on this slide. This is a map of the the regulatory journey for front of pack labeling. A lot of individuals might think that it started in February 2018 with the Gazette One and the proposed regulatory framework, but I would argue that it started back in 2014, where some of the modernization to the nutrition fact ta facts table came into play that really facilitated the cohesive message around front of pack labeling in its current form. So from 2014 to 2016, the government of Canada took, uh, um, took the initiative to update or modernize some of the nutrition facts information um, currently uh, that, that, were, that were in place. Some of the daily values for nutrients have changed. And I think there was some realization that some nutrients concern might've changed over the years. And maybe some additions to the nutrient facts table might facilitate better uh, choices with respect to foods and dietary patterns in Canada. So with the proposed guidance and framework in 2014, the government proposed to reduce the sodium daily value from 2,400 milligrams to 2,300 milligrams. The saturated fat 20 gram per day uh, as, 10, as a, uh, as uh, representing 10% of energy from a 2000 kilocalorie diet held true at that time. And then there was the introduction of the total sugar daily value at 100 grams per day. Um, these recommendations went for, put forward into Gazette 1 and then Gazette 2 in uh, 2016 with the implementation and the adoption of these regulatory changes. Um, I would also note that the other addition was uh, with respect to the nutrient facts table to highlight on the nutrient fact table for from a nutritional perspective, what constitutes a little of a nutrient, and what constitutes a lot of a nutrient. So here we have an updated nutrient facts table with daily values for sugars and sodium saturated fat status quo was maintained and you can see here at the bottom of the nutrient facts table it says that 5% or less is a little and 15% more of a lot which sort of sets those thresholds that came into play later on with front and pack. In October 2016, Health Canada launched its healthy eating strategy with the 
um, with the intent to engage the public and stakeholders on the use of front of pack labeling for sugar, sodium, and saturated fats. It, with that, they launched a consultation for front of pack labeling in November 2016, which encompassed some proposed mock ups of front of pack labels, which were later tested by um, a Sage Research Corporation, uh, where the report came out in March 2017. And then in September 2017, the government publicly engaged with the food industry, academia, and health focused associations, such as Dietitians of Canada, to discuss not only the results from this study, but also proposed frameworks for front of pack labeling, such as the facts up front labeling that or traffic light systems that are currently used um, in the US and other jurisdictions. In February 2018, proposed regulations were gazetted. And then new mock-ups of front of pack labels underwent a, an online research with consumers to uh, decipher their, their effectiveness um, around um, interpreting, interpreting uh, foods with higher levels of saturated fat, sodium, and, uh, and sugar. Now, it's important to note that there are other things in play occurring at this time. So in 2012, realizing that sodium levels were fairly high uh, in, in purchased food products in Canada, the government of Canada worked with the food industry and established a phased approach to reducing um, uh, sodium levels in manufactured, pro manufactured food across food categories using a, um, a graded approach across three phases uh, that would differ across food categories depending on the, the, the start point for sodium levels in the food. At the end of that uh, voluntary period, when they reevaluated the food system, they realized that only 40, uh, 48 percent of stakeholders did not make any progress, or 48 percent of categories did not make any progress with, re with respect to sodium levels. Only 28 percent uh, met phase one reduction targets, 10 percent met phase two targets, and only 14 percent met phase three target targets. And taken this taken together with the previous data I showed you around sodium consumption across age and sex groups um, in Canada demonstrate probably demonstrated um, um, uh, reinforcement of the need to try and limit um, sodium intakes um, amongst Canadians and put a little bit more onus um, on the consumer. At the same time, in April 2019, Canada's Food Guide, the latest iteration of Canada's Food Guide, was published with increased emphasis on sodium-free sugars and saturated fat, discussing the effects of these nutrients on cardiometabolic outcomes, as well as dental caries as it pertains to uh, free sugars in the diet. Following federal elections in December 2019 and 2021, mandate letters to the Minister of Health reiterated the call for front-of-pack labeling to help Canadians uh, choose healthier food options within the marketplace. And with that, um, I just want to point your point your attention to a study published um, in October 2020, spearheaded by Health Canada, where those last mock-ups of front of pack labels were tested in a grocery store environment amongst consumers, where consumers were given tasks to perform, nutritional type tasks, and the, the research team evaluated time, uh, visual processing and successful decision-making time, and across all proposed front of pack labels, the, the visual processing time to complete these tasks were far below the time required based on just the nutrient, nutri, nutri, uh, the nutrient facts table, indicating um, in, acutely the effectiveness of front of pack labeling, which brings us to July 22nd and uh, the implementation of the, the regulatory framework, which uh, comes into a for enforcement January 1, 2026. So with that, I'm going to transition to the regulatory criteria around front of pack labeling in Canada and discuss probably some of the more pertinent um, um, uh, criteria around front of pack labeling and implementation um, and some of the exemptions um, that are in place with respect to this uh, regulatory initiative in Canada. So again, here are the, the, the front of pack labels that are implemented in Canada to highlight saturated fat, sodium and sugars, which foods <coughs> Excuse me. Which foods would require front of pack labeling? Well, the the uh, the short and long is that most foods that require a nutrient facts table would be subject to uh, front of pack labeling if DVs for sodium, saturated fat, and sugar are exceeded. The way that the percent DV is calculated for these three nutrients of concern are per reference amount or serving size, whichever is longer. 
A reference amount, the best way for me to summarize a reference amount, it's, it's more of a regulated uh, serving size. Uh, generally speaking, however, the reference amount and the serving size are very close to each other, if not the same. And that's as per the regulatory modernization that happened around nutrition facts tables back in 2016. If you were to Google reference amounts in Canada, it would bring you to a, a technical document from the government of Canada, where you can see here, this is just a snapshot, but across various food categories, you can see what the reference amount of a food would be and what is the household measure pertaining to that reference amount would be here in, in uh, column A of column three. Now, generally speaking, for most prepackaged foods, that 15% DV will be the cutoff. However, there are some exceptions. There is the realization that some foods on the market have a very small reference amount of less than 30 grams or 30 mils. And these can be concentrated sources of, of, of nutrients of concern. So for these types of foods, the threshold for triggering front to pack labeling is 10% the DV, not 15% the DV. And then the other uh, uh, um, concession to this is for prepackaged main dishes. Uh, met main dish is a new definition under the new regulatory framework. Main dishes do not require the addition of ingredients except for water and contain at least two of dairy alternatives, meat, poultry alternatives, fresh fruit and vegetables, except for those that would contain high levels of nutrients of concern like sugar and sodium, like pickles, relishes and olives, as well as bread, cereals and grains. And the reason for this concession is that it would be expected that for a main dish, which is a fairly large serving that can be multiple, contain multiple components, it would be expected that a main dish on a whole would, it would have levels of nutrients concern that would exceed that 15% threshold. Again, uh, if you're looking for that, that the daily value, I, I summarized them earlier in my presentation, but if you were to type in or, or Google or, or search for daily values Canada, you'd be brought to the government of Canada's technical document on daily values. And there we are listed here in a very succinct way. You'd be looking at column three for foods intended for children one year of age or older, but less than four years of age, or for children four years of age or, or older and adults would be your cutoff. There is the realization that food packages come in all shapes and sizes. So there is a compendium of nutrient symbol formats available to industry, where depending on the size of your package or your principal display panel on your package, you would choose the appropriate front of pack label that would be able, that you would have the ability to uh, summarize uh, the information accordingly. In addition, there are specifications associated with the label. If I read correctly, you can email the Government of Canada and they'll send you the raw graphic file for front of pack labels, but there are specifications again outlined in the Government of Canada's technical documents around front of pack labeling on the expectations with respect to font size and the border, uh, the buffer border around the front of pack labeling to prevent interference from other um, other um, characteristics of a, of, a, of a label. In terms of positioning on a, on a package, uh, the upper right corner of the label on the principal display panel, but this position can vary depending on the package. So if you have a prepackaged product where the principal display panel height is less than its width, like a rectangle, um, the front of pack uh, label or the nutrition symbol will be on the right hand, so the right half of the panel. Any other type package would be on the upper half of the um, of the principal display panel. So with that, it's important to note that there are some nutrient-based exemptions to front of pack labeling where you might say, well, there's substantial amounts of nutrients concern in these foods or ingredients, but they would not trigger the use of the, the nutrition symbol on pack. And for sodium and saturated fat, these exemptions are fruits and vegetables, milks, eggs, nuts, seeds, associated butters, vegetable and marine oils, marine and freshwater animal products. And the reason for this is, is that there's an acknowledgement that these do have healthy nutritional profiles or are associated with reduced cardiometabolic risks. So fruits and vegetables, for example, um, have recognized health benefits as we all know. Um, um, despite the fact that say fruits, for example, can contain high levels of sugar. Milks are consistent with Canadian dietary guidelines. Eggs have a healthy fatty acid profile and the reference amount is just at that 15% DV for saturated fat. And we know that nuts, seeds, um, and associated butters, vegetable and marine oils, and those other products have a healthy fatty acid profile. The caveat to those latter three 
is that uh, you are exempt when the saturated fat level is less than 30% saturated fat, which is an important um, distinction, an important um, aspect to, uh, to keep in mind. Similar to sodium and saturated fat, there are um, concessions with respect to sugar. So again, fruits and vegetables, milks, nuts and seeds, as well as grains and legumes, which can contain simple carbohydrates as well. And the rationale again being uh, your association with um, healthy dietary patterns and promotion in Canada's dietary guidelines as part of our national nutrition policy. Some of the more contentious um, um, food groups that came um, into play during some of the consultations um, were cheese and yogurt and meat products. And I'm gonna quickly go through um, these concessions with respect to these products and front of pack labeling. So cheese and yogurt are both exempt from front of pack labeling with the recognition that they are a source, a primary source of calcium amongst Canadians and calcium has been listed as a nutrient of concern in Canada and is a mandatory nutrient that is listed on the front of pack label, um, uh, not front of pack, sorry, the nutrient facts table of uh, Canadian food products. It's also acknowledged that sodium is required as part of the cheese making process, but this exemption, exemption with respect to sodium only applies to cheeses made from dairy products. And this is likely, and, I, and I'm only speculating, but could stem from the changing food landscape with respect to some of the plant derived cheese products making their way into the market with various nutritional um, um, compositions. The saturated fat exemption um, extends from what I discussed previously. So if the saturated fat in cheese and yogurt is coming from milk, nuts and seeds, uh, vegetables, marine fatty acids, or marine and freshwater products, and the saturated fat is less than 30%, uh, then you're, you're, you're exempt from, from um, claiming a uh, front of pack label if the saturated fat comes from these sources. The caveat being is that the, the cheese and yogurt has to provide the thresholds for calcium because that's where the exemption is really derived. So for small reference amount foods, at least 10% the DV for calcium, for reference amounts larger than 30 grams, 15% or more, the DV for calcium has to be in the food. Um, and again, there's a sugar exemption. So if you're sweetening your yogurt with real cuts of uh, fruit, for example, and you hit a, um, um, a higher threshold for sugar, you would be exempt from claiming front of pack, knowing that whole and cuts of fruit, for example, um, are associated with healthy dietary patterns. And this is just an extension of my previous slide. Both intact and ground meats um, are exempt from front of pack labeling because they're difficult to standardize as per the, the regulatory framework that came into play. Some meats have higher levels of saturated fat and others do not. And um, it was originally uh, proposed that ground meat would be subject to front of pack labeling, but given that um, the um, front of pack labeling could impose the perception that ground meats are less healthy than intact corresponding foods, um, this exemption was extended to ground meat as well. Other exemptions, sweetening agents like maple syrups, fats and oils and butters and margarines, as well as any foods with a common name salt, um, they're exempt from front of pack labeling because it would be redundant. It's expected that table salt has salt and sodium, for example. So with that, I just sort of want to flip things on its head a little bit and, and new stakeholders to the marketplace you know, might see front of pack labeling as a threat. And I think if you were to read some of the consultation that occurred over the, over the course of the last five or six years, I think there are certain industry stakeholders that uh, would, would feel that way. Um, I think myself, I maybe me being subjective in some cases have flip-flopped, but I think moving forward, knowing that we do have a regulatory framework in place now, this is aligned with where the world is going. We're not the only jurisdiction imposing um, these types of regulations. And I think more regulations around the world with respect to front of pack labeling for nutrients concern are on the horizon. I think it's more advantageous to look at this as an opportunity moving forward, um, especially as Canada um, has a changing food landscape and there's real opportunity in Canada to provide new and innovative foods to Canadians and other um, citizens around the world. And I think it's important to note here, just looking at consumer data, this is from the International Food Information Council published over the last 12 years and consistently speaking outside taste and price, which is understandable, healthfulness is the third highest purchase driver um, um, consistently over time with, I don't think there's any um, indication that, that 
that healthfulness of foods is something that consumers is looking for. I think that's going to be consistent for some time. And I think this um, builds on the fact that we do have a changing consumer um, around the world, where from the 50s to the early 2000s, there was really value in getting the most bang for your buck, where price, volume, convenience was a primary driver. The value proposition was cheap and low quality food. Um, maybe not knowing that you were buying low quality food, but there was probably less emphasis and awareness from the consumer part on, on the nutrition composition of the food. And I would say not all consumers, but there is a change in consumer behavior where we are seeing increased value in context quality and even sustainability around food, where the consumer wants that higher quality food play. And I think this is where stakeholders can really present themselves as the new regulations present, them, present themselves moving forward. If we take a look, for example, at the plant-based food sector and look at a SWOT analysis, looking at strengths of the sector, there's an inherent belief that plant-based foods are healthier and relatively more free from concerns. They're more environmentally sustainable. They provide more dietary variety, which is a real opportunity that there are these core beliefs around the sector. And these are attitudes, motivations, and emotional drivers around, around foods, which is fair. We are very emotionally driven when it comes to, to food choices. But at the end of the day, if we want that consumer that values quality, in the context of dietary quality or sustainability to stick around beyond that first point of purchase or trying something new. There is the need to deliver on the function, and that is the foods are healthier, they do taste better, they do have better texture, and they are convenient, depending on what the consumer is looking for. So I would argue that the opportunity to hear with front of pack labeling is it could be a point of differentiation for some stakeholders with respect to providing the consumer with those functional attributes that align with their emotional drivers around food. If we look at Canada's food guide, uh, one would argue that perhaps they're demonizing or they're being reductionist with respect to saturated fat and sodium and sugar. And I would say, I think the, the, the desire would be that if you're highlighting something like saturated fat, it would lead the consumer to consume um, perhaps um, a food with higher in mono and polyunsaturated fats, for example, knowing that dietary fibers, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, and other, and other dietary components are associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease. And that dietary pattern approach is, is the most efficacious. So if we look at reduction in premature mortality, for example, and reductionist views looking at just say reduction in animal proteins or reduction in calories, but rather look at dietary approaches, the reduction in premature mortality um, is compounded by taking a dietary pattern approach, looking at reduced risk of obesity, being overweight and consuming healthy dietary components as a part of a dietary pattern, not so much looking at just animal proteins or calories in an isolated instance in terms of dietary modification. If we look at dietary components around the world based on um, um, reference daily intakes, you can see that across jurisdictions, red meat consumption is exceeding um, dietary reference intakes. That's not to say that, that red meat is bad, and that's not what I'm saying here but we're probably indexing a little bit lower on other dietary healthy components of dietary patterns where perhaps a re, uh, rebalancing of dietary patterns would bring uh, better outcomes with respect to cardiometab cardiometabolic disease. If we look at uh, global levels of, of death attributed to diet, it's easy to call out things like sodium, diets low in polyunsaturated fat, which you can assume are high in saturated fat or diets high in sweet, sugar sweet beverages. But perhaps by reducing consumption of, of, of uh, saturated fat or nutrients concern and indexing a little bit higher on foods, the compounded benefit with respect to disease risk um, um, would, be, would be demonstrated more holistically. And we see that in dietary patterns broadly across the board with various dietary patterns um, that would likely align with where Canada's health nutrition policy is leaning around uh, reduced markers for um, um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease um, risk, as well as markers of uh, being overweight and uh, LDL cholesterol and so on and so forth. So hopefully with all that, the key takeaways from today's presentation is that Canada is one of many jurisdictions adopting front of pack labeling to assist consumers to identify foods that are higher in saturated fat, sodium and sugar. The thresholds for triggering front of pack labeling are based on established criteria around nutrient content claims. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie, um, in some regards, one could argue that they are controversial, but um, there seems to be consistency um, um, around the world. 
Observed data demonstrate that consumption of nutrients of concern are above the DRIs for some age and sex groups in Canada. The restrict criteria around the implementation of front of pack label symbol symbols, uh, stakeholders are encouraged to consult the government of Canada's technical documents to ensure compliance. Compliance is January 1, 2026. And while it is unclear about the long-term effectiveness of the strategy or this regulation, there could be an opportunity for the food sector to focus on food innovation and renovation that do not trigger labels as a point of differentiation, engagement, and alignment with changing consumer for the adoption of healthy dietary patterns. And with that, I will uh, try and answer um, any of your questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, I learned a lot and I'll say it's just about lunchtime here in Saskatchewan and all this talk of cheese and olives and snack foods has got me hungry. So I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Um, if folks do have questions, the, the Q&A box should be functioning down at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to pop them into there. Um, we'll give folks a couple of minutes to do that. And, and while we're waiting, Chris, maybe just a, a question from me. Um, about the effectiveness of, of this and reports or success of e efficacy of front of package labeling um, to curb consumption of nutrients of concern. Like, what do you, what have you learned or what do you foresee as the effectiveness of this? Yeah, I think it's um, just from the, the literature search that I've done over the last um, few weeks, um, in terms of long-term effectiveness, I think the jury's still out in the sense that front of pack labeling, not only in Canada, but even other jurisdictions is fairly new. And even uh, it's been implemented on a voluntary basis. Uh, that being said, some of the acute studies demonstrate that when you put consumers in front of the front of pack label, when you give them a task in the grocery store consistently, uh, they're able to use that front of pack labeling um, um, to more effectively in a more timely fashion um, uh, achieve the task with success compared to just relying on something like a nutrient facts table. So acutely, there does seem to be success. Some of the concerns from stakeholders have been, well, the principal display panel is getting increasingly busy. There's a lot of other mm -hmm. things that value to consumers. So there's organic labeling and, and all, you know, all kinds of things, uh, no GMOs and things like that. The question is over time, does the consumer start to see through the front of pack label? But uh, only time will tell. Yeah. Great, thank you. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat just yet. So um, we'll maybe hold that open just for another minute or two. One more question for me, Chris, and if we don't get any others come in, we'll, we'll let you go. But we always think, you know, we obviously are very focused on what's happening in Canada, but we have that big neighbor to the South. So is there anything on the horizon for front of package labeling in this, the US that could impact what happens here in Canada? Um, I Right now in the United States, there is front of pack labeling, but it is voluntary. I would say that a lot of the stakeholders are using the facts up front nutrition labeling, where it looks like a looks like a chiclet, a band of chiclets, calling out levels of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of various nutrients on pack, but it's voluntary. I haven't seen anything um, on the horizon from a regulatory perspective or a policy perspective. Um, and talking to some of my colleagues in the industry south of the border, um, there doesn't seem to be anything in their in their mind um, on the horizon with respect to front of pack labeling. Okay, interesting. Good. Well, we uh, just I guess would like to say thank you to everybody who took the time to join today. I know I learned learned a lot along the way, and I'm sure that you did as well. So. With that, we will um, maybe, you know, put the end to this webinar today. And uh, Chris has provided his contact information up on the screen. So if you'd like to reach out directly, you can certainly do that. Um, so we will we'll end things there today. And thank you all for attending. Take care. <laughs>